Hi, I'm Martin Woods and today we're going to be talking about how to revitalise common science fiction fantasy tropes and this is part of Authority Magazine series on creating compelling sci-fi and fantasy stories. So tropes are the common themes that you find in sci-fi, fantasy or any genre for that matter and they, they can create very enjoyable stories However, if you overuse them, it means that your readers will really know where your story is going, particularly people who read a lot. So what this is, is it's a way of using a trope, but also treating it in a bit of a different way to give an interesting plot twist. What I thought I would do is go through a five-step process, but first I'll read a short story which really illustrates how to do this. A Goblin Slave I marched in line with 30 goblins on my left and 19 on my right. Our every movement was precise, predetermined. We were not some feeble creatures born from the womb, but were made from the earth, and that meant control. Control for the Dark Lord, powerlessness for me. His magic imbued us and forced us onwards. We didn't even have the power to talk unless it was to serve his end. Our limbs moved regardless of our own desire. It's only in those rare moments of stillness where we were without command that our eyes revealed the truth. Glancing from one to another, pupils shrunken in, with terror and revulsion at our dismembered bodies, at the actions we would be forced to commit. The elven bowmen appeared before us, moving with a precision all the more beautiful in the knowledge that each had their free will intact. As I crouched forward and tightened my grip on my axe, preparing to charge, one thought played over and over in my mind. Let them kill the Dark Lord before me. Only then will I be free. I let out a blood-curling howl and charged. So, I'll be talking a bit more about this as I go through the five-study process. So the first stage is very simple, it's to choose a trope. So tropes are recurring themes that crop up in science fiction or fantasy and in other genres um, that are very popular, they're identifiable and particularly in fantasy some of them have almost come to define the genre itself. So um, good versus evil is a very common one and it's one that in The Goblin Slave I, I choose to revitalise. So you normally have like, yeah, the goblins are evil, the elves are good or the humans are good or whatever. And I wanted to show, oh, what if it's the goblins aren't evil? What if actually they are just being forced to act against their will? Um, you have a reluctant hero trope. That's quite a common one. It's someone who often doesn't know they have any power, perhaps they're the chosen one, perhaps they're prophesied to be all-powerful. But, you know, actually they're quite happy to go about their everyday life and, you know, they're thrown into the deep end. Um, an evil dark lord, a supreme wizard, or a you know, all-powerful ruler, a damsel in distress, a stranded spaceship, or a powerful magic item. These were all examples of common tropes that you see again and again in fantasy and sci-fi. So the next stage is to decide how you're going to revitalise it. So um, it might be that the powerful magic item breaks, that they're going to use it, they're, they're going to solve the quest, they found the object, they're on their way there, and then it breaks, or it gets stolen or whatever, they can't use it for some reason. And so you're forced to go in a different direction in order to, yeah, in order to complete the book, in order to solve the quest. Um, maybe you discover that the evil wizard is actually grieving a loved one. And that 
you, you discover that that loved one's actually been kidnapped. And so the reason for their, their motivation for the evil that they're doing is grief. You discover, oh, they're still alive. And then you change in direction. And instead of it being, let's kill the evil wizard, you're going, okay, let's rescue the evil wizard's loved one. And then you know, everything will be okay. Um, or it could be that there's an android army and one of them, you know, perhaps that one just there, is kind of going, hmm, something weird's going on here. And gains consciousness, gains independence and aligns with the humans. So instead of it just being humans versus androids, it's okay, one of them starts to figure out, oh, what I, can I do something? And with the example of the goblin slave or the android army, it might even be that you write a few chapters from the perspective of the humans or from the, the elves or whatever, where they're just the baddies. And then suddenly you throw in a chapter written from a goblin's perspective or an android's perspective. And it really creates this interesting, um, interesting dichotomy for the reader, where they expect the story to go in one direction. We're very familiar with trope, that's, that's what a trope is. And so when you, um, it's one way of creating a surprising plot twist quite well, because the reader expects it to go in a certain direction. Because they've, they've read it before, they've seen it in films, they've seen it in TV, and now it's going in a different direction. So that's kind of how um, revitalizing, a, revitalizing a trope can work so well. So stage three is to um, add hints that something different is going to happen. Let's say that the only, let's go back to the goblin slave, if, if the only time you hear about goblins, they are murdering people, they seem to be rioting of their own free will, whatever, then it won't be very believable when something different happens. So you need some kind of hint that, yeah, that you are going to go in a different direction. It might be that there's a rumour of a peaceful goblin nation or some you know, prophecy of goblins and elves living together in harmony or something. Or it could be as simple as a look in the eye. That, you know, you're in battle with a goblin and you just see in their eyes some, you know, some sense of despair or whatever. And if it's well written, it can move on. And your protagonist may not realise it, but it will just mean that it's sowed that promise in the reader's mind, something's going to happen and that all is not quite as, as it seems. It doesn't mean that the protagonist needs to know that. The protagonist may just dismiss it. I've got him being crazy. Kill the goblin, move on with, with the story. But it means that the reader you know, has a hint. Four is to add red herrings. You've added a hint, but you also need to, you know, a storyline is all about complexities and subtleties. Um, it's about a lot of other things too, but yeah. Um, so it could be a hint that you are following the original, original trope. You know, that you do show the goblins being evil. It doesn't work if all the goblins do is hang out and party and yeah, have fun. Um, or it could be that you show that you're going to go in a different direction entirely. Maybe the rumour is of the goblins charming whole villagers and that the villagers um, fall under their spell. And it could be later on in the story you discover no, actually, they just became friends. But in order to like, suppress that information, the Elvin leaders decided to spread this rumour that they can charm people and get them to do their bidding or whatever. So it could be that you, you indicate you're going in the original direction of the trope or that you've, you're going to go in a completely different direction. Either, either can work. Um, and five, is, it's similar to the red herrings and the hints, but it's a bit of a broader picture uh, analogy, which is to create a balance between what happens before you discover the trope and what happens afterwards. So let's take the, the, the example of the, 
the evil wizard who we discover has had someone kidnapped and the second half of the book is about rescuing them and maybe the protagonist actually falls in love with the evil wizard and they end up becoming the best of friends. In, a, in an example like that there's a risk that you have the first half of the story being to go on this epic quest to kill the wizard and the second half of the story is a bit of a romance. The problem with that is that people who enjoy the first half might be put off by the romance or that people who would really enjoy the romance and the twist don't ever get to it because they're, you know, they read the first couple of chapters and they're like, oh god man, there's too much fighting and blood and whatever, I want a romance, you know, I thought this was a romance. So you're, gonna, you're going to risk putting off the readers who will never get to the second half or getting bad reviews from the readers who get to the second half but then don't enjoy it, they think the book's gone downhill. So how you can solve that problem is to add elements from the second half to the first half and vice versa. So I wouldn't necessarily go with a falling in love with the dark wizard um, you know, trope divergence myself, but it's an option. But let's say you do that, it might be that in the first half your protagonist is in love with someone else. Um, perhaps they have uh, a mentor, that's another common trope, and a common trope is that they, the mentor dies, or that they disappear somehow. So it might be that in the first half of the book you have that element of a romance, and then in the second half of the book it's a different romance. Or it could be that in the second half of the book the quest changes. They still have to do a quest, but it's no longer to um, defeat and murder the wizard, it's to rescue the person that the wizard has lost. And that way you, you have the elements of romance, you have the elements of solving this epic quest in both halves, and it means that readers who like the first half will also enjoy the second half. So, so they're basically the five stages. Choose a trope, decide how you're going to revitalise it, add some hints, add some red herrings, and then balance both halves. Thanks for watching this video and thanks to Authority Magazine for giving me this opportunity. I'm Martin Woods and I hope you found it useful.